Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Rowell and I'm a solicitor who are currently lecturing at Macquarie University in Intellectual Property Law, int uh, Information Technology Law and Cybersecurity. And I'm basically going to take you through uh, two things in this presentation I, I want to get through. So the first one is I want to talk about how cybersecurity and the internet now, there's a booming industry of cybersecurity, which you guys could consider as a job. And the second one is, uh, you might have noticed I'm a little bit younger than everyone else who's presented here today, so I can talk you through my university experience because it wasn't that long ago. Okay, so the first thing is uh, cyber attacks, it kind of was always thought about for a while, but no one actually thought it would ever happen in the sense of like it existed in science fiction, this idea that a foreign hackers would shut down a country by hacking the banking system or the power system. But then in 2007, we actually saw this become a reality. So in Estonia, a lot of you probably haven't heard of the country Estonia, um, but they actually invented Skype. That's their big claim to fame. And in 2007, they had a, there's a lot of tension in Estonia. They have got a history with the Soviet Union. We don't need to go into that. But essentially, there's a lot of tension about the position of a statute. Uh, the local Estonians wanted to move the statue because they didn't like it, it reminded them of their Russian past. And the local ethnic Russians wanted to keep it there because they were proud of their Russian past. So this turned into a lot of protesters. And the Russian government itself warned Estonia that if you move that statue, there will be consequences, which was all quite ominous. And they did anyway. And then shortly after, uh, the cyber attack hit the country. And again, this is Europe's most connected country. And they invented Skype and completely shut it down. The national infrastructure, so the broadcasters went down, the television went down, the police, you couldn't call the police because the, the triple zero uh, phone line went down, the banks all went down so no one could transfer money. So people can't transfer money. Then think about it, that's your pay pass, that's your FPOS, no one can buy anything. And the national government just ground to a halt. And this had never happened before in a country and the Estonian government was left uh, completely flawed because they, they didn't expect it, they didn't know what to do. So they caught, so the Estonian defense minister actually said that the hacking was such a threat to national security, it was the same as if closing a country's port. Now to put that into context, to close a country's port, you have to move in troops, you have to, you know, airstrikes, it's a full order military operation, except this was uh, achieved about a single shot fired and without anyone actually going into the country. So Estonia, which is a NATO country, NATO is the North American Treaty Organization. It's one of the largest military alliances in the planet. They contacted NATO to help them and NATO sent in advisors to basically watch because they didn't know what to do either. No one had done this before. It was all new territory. And it's basically made this science fiction scenario where hackers could shut down a country. It became a reality. Um, no one fired a shot. And the most scary part of it was that they never knew who did it. Now, it's pretty obvious the Russians were behind it, but they could never prove it because the nature of the internet is that you can use anonymizing technology. It's very hard to actually find a, a culprit. And this essentially is the future of war. This idea that warriors are the strongest, tallest, and gruffest person on the battlefield is very uh, outdated. Now we're looking at hackers. So the uh, computer specialists of the world are actually going to be the most dangerous people in an army because they can use what we call, uh, it's not very asymmetrical, which means that you can have a small group of hackers, three or four, who can shut down an entire country because they can leverage off their technology. Whereas before, if you wanted to attack a country, you would need you know, thousands of troops, planes, pilots, this gigantic organization. But now we're seeing the rise of these small or online criminal networks that can do disproportionate damage. So how is this possible? How can you shut down an entire country without violence, without uh, bombing infrastructure? Well, the thing is, the problem is that most countries' critical infrastructure is now connected to the internet. So what is critical infrastructure? Basically, there's a very lengthy definition there from the uh, ASIO's submission to the Australian Senate, but the crux of it is, is critical infrastructure is anything that's critical to the nation running. So economy, banking and finance. Banking is critical to Australia running. Transport is critical. Energy, so if you should turn the power off, if anyone's had a power blackout, you know that within a few days, your life is used to living. Um, very difficult, you know, you can't store food, you can't make calls, you can't go on the internet, there's no Wi-Fi, it's, it's a terrible existence. Uh, health, hospitals, right? If you shut down hospitals, people die. So these are very extreme um, situations, but the point is 
that because the internet is ubiquitous, everything's connected to the internet, which means that everything is what we call an attack vector. That means anything, everything can be attacked. So your smartphone can be attacked, your, your watches that are connected to the internet. And it's only going to get more and more um, attack vectors because there's a new uh, fad called the Internet of Things where everything will be connected. So it's very foreseeable in the future that you'll have shoes that connect to the internet and they can track where you walk. And there's now fridges that connect to the internet and they'll order food for you when you run out of food. And so every item in your household, clocks, t television remote controls, TVs, will all be connected to the internet. And so if they're connected to the internet, that means they can be hacked. And that means that you can bring down entire sectors of a country. So that was Estonia. Estonia is a country in Eastern Europe. You know, it's, it's far removed from us. So why should we be concerned about cybersecurity? Well, it's actually happened in Australia and in a fairly hilarious way. This is one of my favorite um, examples. And this has actually put Australia on the map in terms of cybersecurity. I remember when I was in Washington, DC, uh, I was in the Law and Police Museum and on the wall they had all the cyber attacks around the world and in big thick letters they were like eco cyber eco-terrorism and they had this case of a good friend Victor Bowden. So who is Victor Bowden? So Victor Bowden is a man in his late 40s and he worked for the Hunter Watertech, which is an Australian firm that installed SCADA. So SCADA systems are basically systems that monitor pumps, for instance, for radio controlled sewage equipment and Marucci Shire Council in Queensland. Now, Mr. Bowden worked for them for a long time. He gave his all and he thought he was due for promotion. However, the Shire Council thought he was due to be let go. So they fired him and he responded like any sane adult and went and found a new job. No, that would be too easy. He actually decided to then go around in his car. He stole some of the radio equipment because remember all of this is controlled remotely by radio systems. So he stole the radio equipment and drove around in his car hacking into the radio equipment and then dumping sewage 800 litres of raw sewage into the local parks, rivers and the grounds of the Hyatt Regency Hotel as a massive revenge attack for losing his job. Now we went to jail for this and it actually could have been a lot worse. Luckily the, the local raw sewage didn't spill into the water supply but if it did it could have poisoned many people and you know it resulted in deaths. And he was able to do that because he knew the system. So this cyber attack, cyber crime is uh, a growing threat both from outsiders, from you know, Russian government, and from uh, annoyed insiders. We call them the insider threat. Okay, so what are SCADA systems? Stay with me, it's not as boring as it sounds. So what is a SCADA system? So a SCADA system, as I said, monitors real-time industrial systems. What does that mean? It means temperatures, pressure, power level, and flow rate. So why do we care about that? Because think big things that can do damage to uh, countries. So if you're gonna invade a country, for instance, in World War II, you may be familiar with the dam busters. So they were basically, how did they uh, disable the city? Well, if they knew if they blew up the dam, it would release the water and it would flood the surrounding area and it would cripple the country. But that, uh, again, you have to get a plane into that country, you have to fly it at the right angle, and you have to hit a huge chunk of concrete with a very powerful explosive. However, with a SCADA system, you could just turn off the dam and then all the water gets released, same effect. And so, and the problem is, is most SCADA systems themselves were designed with old technology and not with security in mind. So they're designed in the 80s. And these things were designed with stability in mind. So if you have a system that is regulating the power flow or the water in a dam, you don't exactly play around with it. You don't want to update the system because if you put in uh, new software and that software crashes, then you can't just tell the, the country to go about water for a few days while you fix it. So these systems never get updated. They get left alone, which is so that they're huge sitting targets. So therefore, it's actually conceivable that someone would design a virus to then attack a, a system's, a nation's critical infrastructure. So if they could then design, design a computer program that attacked a computer, uh, turned off all the dams or destroyed a power plant, then they could essentially invade a country without ever firing a shot, without killing a person, and there's no political fallout. Like the attack on Estonia, you couldn't prove it was the Russians enough for them to actually retaliate, and you could do this. And we've actually seen this happen. Stuxnet was discovered lurking in the data banks of power plants, traffic control systems, and factories around the world. 20 times more complex than any previous virus code, it had an array of capabilities. Among them, the ability to turn up the pressure inside nuclear reactors or switch off oil pipelines. And Stuxnet could tell the system operators everything was normal. Unlike most viruses, Stuxnet doesn't carry the usual forged security clearance that helps viruses burrow into systems. 
it actually had a real clearance, stolen from one of the most reputable computer technology companies in the world. It exploited security gaps that system creators are unaware of. These holes are known as zero days, and the most successful viruses exploit them. The details of a zero day can be sold on the black market for $100,000. Stuxnet took advantage of 20 zero days. But once it got into a system, it didn't always activate. Buried deep in the Stuxnet code was a specific target. Without that target, the virus remained dormant. What was it looking to shut down? The centrifuges that spin nuclear material at Iran's enrichment facilities. Stuxnet was a weapon, the first to be made entirely out of code. The Washington-based Institute for Science and International Security says the virus may have shut down a thousand centrifuges at Natanz, Iran's main enrichment facility, last year. In November, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's nuclear watchdog, said Iran had suspended work at its nuclear facilities without explaining why. Many observers credited Stuxnet. Last month, the Iranian government conceded the virus's infection of the Bashir nuclear facility, still under construction, meant that switching the plant on could lead to a national electricity blackout. Iran has responded to the attack with an open call for hackers to join the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and has reportedly amassed the second largest online army in the world. So who was behind Stuxnet? There's no evidence beyond rumour. Some have it that Israel is responsible because the virus code apparently contains references to the Hebrew Bible. Others believe the US was involved in the testing and development. The finger has even been pointed at Siemens mobile phone company, whose software is used by the Iranian regime. The most important question may not be who designed it, but who will redesign it. The evolution has been so fast that nine months after its detection, the first virus that could crash power grids or destroy oil pipelines is available online for anyone to download and tinker with. You can watch people on YouTube pulling Stuxnet apart. It's an open source weapon. And there's no way of knowing who will use it or what they will use it for. So that's the Stuxnet. Stuxnet. Net. <clears throat> And essentially that is, again, we're seeing it as reality. So basically it was an Israel, uh, US allegedly project, because we can never confirm, that targeted the Nantaz nuclear enrichment facility in Iran and shut it down. Now, without getting into the complexity of it, it's just a new way of doing warfare. Because the politics of the region were that for Israel to shut down, if it was Israel, allegedly, to shut down Iran, nuclear facility, they would have to bomb it. So if you bombed a nuclear facility, that's an act of war, and then Iran would respond, and then uh, maybe Iran has nuclear weapons, and so there would be an entire region would go into conflict and would see mass warfare. But they were able to achieve the same result without any of the political fallout through the use of cyber weaponry. And this is the first one that we've seen, and the sophistication of it was, has been unseen before. Now, this is actually a little bit old. This is, I think, 2011. So we've had five years since that. And as you know, five years ago, if you looked at your iPhone, and five years now, you can make leaps and bounds. So this current cyber weaponry that exists today that we have no idea about because we haven't seen its use in this extent before. There was literally very no real cyber weaponry experts before 2011, which is four years ago. So this stuff is brand new, the law is still grappling with it. Which is why I think it's a very exciting space to be in, and why you guys should be considering working in that, because you could become experts very quickly, because there's literally no competition, because no one knows that what's gonna happen. So who are the main um, threats? So the hacktivist groups are online groups of hackers who get together for certain uh, goals. They start off as juvenile pranks, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is quite a mean-spirited prank, where Taylor Swift had an online uh, competition where she would go and play at a school in America and so a bunch of uh, hacktivists got together and rigged it so that she ended up playing in a school for deaf children. Um, they thought that was hilarious. It's classic um, Ameri uh, troll behaviour and this was kind of the benign uh, behaviour on the internet. Now it does have a happy ending. They ended up donating $10,000 to the school um, so they, they won in the end so she got the last laugh. But this is the kind of the origins of hacktivism. But right now what, what has happened is 
uh, it's actually moved to nation states and quite sinister. So we have hacked, so they, hacktivists usually take down websites, so they make them unavailable. So what they do is they flood the website with traffic so no one else can go on that, and that can be a problem if that website's a bank or it's a, another online website. They alter the content, so, uh, if, so there was a trial in America of a hacker and Anonymous was unhappy with the way he was treated by the prosecutor, so they hacked the prosecutor's website to show everyone how they're unhappy. There's an information theft, so there was a CEO of a very famous uh, security organization and he said that he was going to unmask Anonymous, so they hacked him and then released, released, released all his emails to the internet. And then you have virtual sabotage, so there was this one of the first worms and it was called Worms Against Nuclear Killers. And basically it was a protest against nuclear weaponry and it was used against NASA. So these start off pretty benign, but it's actually taking quite a sinister term. Turn. So we have ISIS and the cyber caliphate. So ISIS has been kind of breaking new grounds in terms of cyber warfare. They're active recruiters of members on Twitter and Facebook and uh, other types of mediums and they have a cyber caliphate so they use it as a cyber weaponry arm of their um, branch and one of the most famous things they did was they hacked the US Central Command they put the Twitter there and then they put up Cyber Caliphate and then they started making really bizarre tweets and one of them was I love you ISIS and things like that and it was basically it was very teen it was very juvenile so we think it was an ISIS inspired kid who hacked the Twitter account but the point is that Twitter is a medium to get a message out and their message is one of terror so they're trying to use that. And recently they released a kill list of 4,680 names, 168 of them are from Australia, of publicly information that they hacked and they released it online. And they've even released their own app called Daily Dua, um, which is aimed at radicalizing young children. So it teaches you the Arabic alphabet as well as spreading the message of ISIS. I should uh, very much stress that none of you should go looking for that app and download it because it will be very difficult for you to fly afterwards. So uh, don't end up in that no-fly list, don't look for that app. But basically, well now that I told you not to do it, it's kind of like motivation to go look for it. You won't find it anyway, because it's blocked. It will be taken down. But essentially, it's showing how hackers and the cybersecurity, it's going hand in hand with militaries, foreign militaries' terrorism. All right. But there is, uh, on a lighter note, I don't know, this is a bit uh, dark, but we'll see how we go. So anyway, so another use of technology by an ISIS fighter was in 2015, an ISIS fighter posed a selfie against a new command facility. So he's in a Daesh region, and he, they built a brand new uh, central command, and so he took a selfie with it, boasting how powerful ISIS was. Unfortunately, every photo you take actually puts GPS locations in the photo, and that was encrypted in the actual photo itself. And so within 22 hours, the actual building itself was demolished. And I think that's, the, to me, the most uh, obvious example of a photo bomb. Cue pun. Um, but yeah, ISIS is a very prolific user of social media. From reading the program guide, I think you had some other people talking about radicalization. So it, it's all happening online um, in a way that we've just never seen before. All right, can we go? So what are the hackers after? They're after IP. So basically intellectual property. So the most valuable asset companies have is their ideas. And we have this quote by General Keith Alexander, who was the ex-head of NSA. Um, and he was saying it's the greatest transfer of wealth in history because you've got nations like China and Russia actually saying, well, instead of us inventing better cars or you know, inventing better power systems, you know, which takes a long time and a lot of money, we can just take uh, America's and Australia's plans and uh, they're doing it to us and I can guarantee you we're doing it to them as well. Mm. So we have this case study here where essentially we had a system called, an uh, Australian company called Coden who manufactured metal, uh, metal detectors, and I'll just give you the, the really cliff note version. They, they manufactured metal detectors, and then the, they were hacked by a Chinese company who stole their plans, and then the Chinese company made it, started making their own metal detectors using their exact same plan, using all their IP, only cheaper, and they saw their net profit of the company go from $9.2 million in a year from $45 million. So going from $45 million to $9.2 million is a huge fall. The company's pretty much finished, and that's because cybersecurity uh, was not up to scratch. So why, why do you guys uh, are concerned about cybersecurity? Well, if you're looking for jobs, this is a booming industry. This is a 2016 study by Intel Security, and they said 88% of Australian IT decision makers believe there is a shortage of cybersecurity skills in their organization. So 88, so that's the majority. 
and they pay 10% more than other IT jobs. So if you're interested in computers, uh, this would be an area you should look at. And in April this year, again, this is what I love about cybersecurity, it's also very recent. Uh, we have $23 million, $231 million put into cybersecurity, 100 jobs with the invention of 800 uh, coming. So cybersecurity jobs here are the most, uh, the most sought after at the moment in IT school skills. And I've got this great um, article this year again, March 2016, that they said that in December, so it's December 2015, they said there's a million unfulfilled cybersecurity jobs around the world, a million, which is huge. And it's a highly sought after specialization that could earn you $2,500 a day, which is a lot of money. And they're saying that banks now spend about a third of their infrastructure on fending off hackers. So this is a huge field, it's booming, and I think you guys should look into it. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes or so I have, I just want to talk a little bit about my own story and what I'm doing at university and how I ended up here. So this is me, young, naive, world at my feet, unlike the old haggard man you see before you today. So basically I studied a Bachelor of Information Technology and a Bachelor of Law at Macquarie University. It's a five year degree and I wasn't that keen to go into it to be honest. I just came out of high school, I've been studying my entire life and the, the idea of studying for another five years was the last thing I wanted to do. I just wanted to travel the world and kind of see the sights and you know, uh, have some fun because I felt like up until this point all I had done was pass exams and so I didn't want to do it for another five years. Now my parents sat me down and talked to me through that and they said why not both? So I structured my degree so I travelled every single year. So the first year, um, you get three months holidays off, we're actually in it now, where after November you get December, January, February off every year. That's three months, that's a, third of, that's a quarter of the year. You can do some massive trips in that time. So the first year I went to Vietnam when I was uh, 19. My second year I then went to Mexico. And this is with Macquarie University's professional community engagement program. So I did some volunteer work in an orphanage, but I also ended up in Cancun and seeing the other sites as well, the Mexico. And the university gave me some money to do it. So I was actually able to help them fund, get them to help me go overseas because I was doing a program with them. And then the third year, I decided to go overseas to do a semester's exchange in Prague in the Czech Republic and I studied there for six months. Now what was awesome about that was I did the six months overseas in Prague and then I still had that three month killer holiday. So I spent nine months uh, of that year overseas, which is huge. So I almost traveled for a year and lost no time on my university. And this is the point I really want to hang, uh, hammer across to you guys is that a lot of people think it's all or nothing. Oh, if I go to university, but I really want to travel or I really want to uh, work. But that's not true, you can do both. University really is only 24 weeks a year. You have two 12 week semesters, maybe you'll have week 13, but 24 weeks a year, there's 52 weeks in a year. So you've got all this time to do other things. When that can be working, you don't have to just party. It can be working, it can be traveling, it can be, you know, if you want to uh, professional sports, if you want to get into theater and acting, anything like that. But the beautiful thing about it is you're not losing time. What I think is a mistake is a lot of people look at university and go, it's not for me. They take a gap year, they go abroad for a year, they end up staying overseas for two years, and then they come back and they still have to do a three-year degree. It's very hard to get employment without a degree. It's possible. It's very pos it's possible depending on your field and whatever, but a lot of people will need a degree at some point. So instead of taking two years to travel the world and then taking three years to study a degree and then you're five years behind, go into a degree, structure your program such that you take these three-month holidays, and I guarantee you can do both. In the fourth year of my degree, I did student politics. I was elected to the representative council. I had my own private office, which was awesome, and my own secretary, which I never used because I had no work for her. But essentially, I just asked her to organize uh, meetings with my friends <laughs> so we could have lunches together because I didn't have anything for her to do. And then the fifth year of the degree, I worked at a law firm and became a lawyer. So that's me um, getting admitted as a lawyer. And I was got admitted in the ACT, even though I'm from Sydney. And basically because it's me, I had planned to go to South America for six months, booked my ticket, and then realized that I needed to get admitted to the court, and the court date was after my flight. So I decided to get admitted earlier at the ACT, and I literally got in my car, drove three hours, got out of my car, walked into the court, uh, the judge signed my name in the roll, shook his hand, got back in my car, and drove back to Sydney, uh, because I had to. Okay, and then after my law degree, I uh, became a lawyer in the law firm. I decided to backpack around South America for six months, uh, learning Spanish and uh, you know did Machu Picchu, all of that, all of those uh, amazing sites, and then transitioned to cybersecurity consulting, and I did that for a little bit. Uh, it wasn't my cup of tea, but I really enjoyed the subject matter. But I think the consulting lifestyle, you know, ten-hour days, very high pressure, uh, didn't really interest me. So I decided that I wanted to stay in the field, but I just wanted a less uh, more of a life outside of work. 
And so I transitioned to academia. And then now I'm teaching in cybersecurity, information technology, and intellectual property law. So some takeaways from my university experience that I guess I want to encourage you is that it's not all or nothing. University has a lot going on. And if you want to travel, and I guarantee, and I absolutely push you all to travel, I think Australia is really lucky. We've got a great traveling culture. When you travel around the world, the three biggest groups you bump into is other Aussies, Canadians, and people from the UK, because I think they're the big traveling countries. So you can travel and go to uni, you can study and go to uni, and you can work as well. If you, if you want to get started in your career, you want to get some money, um, you know, you're sick of being poor students, then you can structure your university. So you go to university two days a week and you work three days a week. And then in those month off, in mid-semester breaks, so or three months off, you can work full time. So if you're working three days a week during semester, and then you've got four months full time work, you can make quite a bit of money. And you can save, so if you want to buy a house, never in Sydney, um, but that's everyone. Um, and you can do that. And there is a lot to get involved in that keep you things interesting. So five years for me was a long degree and I loved every year of it. It was really interesting. Everything was fresh. It wasn't boring. Um, people who have very boring experiences at university to my, uh, never really look to see what's going on. If you just come to uni and read your books and then scamper out before you talk to anyone, you're going to have a really boring time. But if you get involved in student societies, uh, for instance, at Macquarie, we have a law society. So they are always hosting uh, cruises, for instance. So you go on a cruise ship and everyone just dances and parties. Or there's like law balls, which is like a formal or things like that. And they have them for everything. You know, the accounting society has their own parties. And, uh, and it's not just about like partying. When I say partying, I don't just mean, you know, just going out and drinking. I mean, like meeting other people who are interested in the same things you're interested in, getting network connections, learning about the industry. And so if you're very interested in something, and I think the best thing about university, for me personally, uh, apart from high school, is high school you're forced with the people you're around, right? There's no choice, really. Everyone has to go to high school. So if you're really, really interested in, say, something obscure like the violin or Japanese anime or something very uh, obscure, then you have to bet that there's someone or else around you who's interested as well so you can share it. But if you don't have that, then you're out of luck. But the beautiful thing about university is you can have societies. So you can, you know, you're at university, there's 30,000 students or something at Macquarie. There's going to be a society, there's going to be people interested in what you're interested in. So you can find them and you can uh, really get involved and it. it's quite fulfilling. Um, so my one was public speaking. Uh, so I did a lot of mooting, which is like mock trial. So I used to you know, present in front of fake judges and have competition and I really enjoyed that. And so remember, you have a lot of time to do other things and there's only two semesters of twelve weeks. I think it's this misnomer, everyone's like, oh, I gotta go to uni. Yeah, you gotta go to uni for like six months of the year. Because um, after that six months, you get a lot of downtime. Like I said, you've got about four months of holidays. Now, I just say don't waste those. Use the four months to work. Most people do work because you're living at home and things like that. But you can travel in that time or you can get ahead in your studies if you want to. Or you can read or anything like that. So don't think of like university is very different to a high school experience. It's not this all or nothing embrace where you have to be there nine to three and you don't get a choice and you do what you're told. And uh, university has a lot more free time. It has a lot more um, kind of uh, flexibility. So. Uh, you should feel that free time. The worst thing you can do is just, you know, like a lot of people, like when I was in Prague, for instance, because um, when you study overseas, you, your grades don't matter to your actual degree because it's in a different institution. So you only need 51 to pass. So you can just go out every night and wake up at midday and get through. But so there's things like that. So there's ways, so I'm basically, I'm just trying to hammer home that don't just think it's this all encompassing. Uh, I can't get out of it. So what's my current work? So I already told you um, I'm a lecturer at Macquarie University. So what are the main things I do? I teach classes, I prepare and deliver lectures, and I mark assignments and provide feedback. And what I enjoy about my path, academia, why I chose it over law. So I used to be a lawyer. Uh, I was an information security consultant. And why I like academia is because I'm not stuck at a desk. I get to move around. It's not a corporate job in the sense that you come in, you know, you do nine to five, you leave. I come in when I teach classes and then I can stay if I want or I can go. I don't, I'm not supervised. I get time to travel internationally. So that's a huge part of my life. It always has been. And even this year, I was in Brazil, Cuba and Mexico working with the Mexican Supreme Court. And now I'm going to continue traveling for the rest of my life. It's my favorite thing to do. And I can do that with my current career. And then I'm paid to read things I read anyway. So I think that's one of the Maya key to career success is that if you get paid to do something you'd want to do, I think that's the, the dream. And I really am interested in cybersecurity. I'm really interested in the law. So when that new report comes out from the government, so when the government released its cybersecurity strategy, I was actually very interested in that. And I read that anyway. And had I not been working in academia, I probably would have read it because it's, it's a passion of mine. And so the fact that it relates to my job to me is a sign that I'm in a place where I want to be. 
and you get to spend time with incredibly intelligent people. I think that what I, I really value is that everyone in academia here is because they're interested. Like you don't do academia for the money because if you wanted to make money, there's so many other industries you could do it. Not that you're, you're poor, but I just mean that you're usually intrinsically motivated to be here and that's not common. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of jobs out there that people just grind it out because they have to. They don't care what they do. They're not interested. They just want to leave as soon as it's five o'clock. I feel like academia people are very interested in what they do and they're very smart and so you can learn a lot. So I am a... Uh, as you can tell, I'm probably quite junior in IT law, but there's people at Macquarie University who, you know, uh, Vince Hurley has been a cop for 28 years. So I'm very interested in law enforcement. So if I have uh, interest about policing, I can go talk to him. And he's probably one of the leading experts in Australia in that field, and you will get information straight from the source. So, and that to me is very fulfilling. Okay, so where to from here, in case you were wondering, because I all know you, uh, like my parents, and want to know what my plan is. So basically, to progress in academia, I need to go back to university. So while I'm trying to sell you all on a university experience, I'm also selling myself, because I need to go back as well and do a PhD. So I'm currently applying to law schools in America, because I want to travel. So if I'm going to do more study, I'm going to do it overseas. So I'm going to head to America and write my PhD on the legality of mitigating cyber striking. So I want to look at that if someone hacks you, so you know, Coden, for instance, got their IP stolen, can they hack back and re-steal their uh, material or if someone's hacking your computer can you then hack them back and destroy their system before they destroy you it's called mitigative counter-striking but a lot of people think it's like vigilantism like it's just allowing you to uh, to go and out of revenge get those who've got you which we don't really want to uh, create that kind of atmosphere so I'm gonna write a PhD in that in theory anyway and then once the PhD is finished I will then get a faculty position lecturing and then you just jump up the ranks and then hopefully I'll get into publishing and some sort of conference speaking Cool. So that's essentially the end of the presentation. Um, hopefully you learned something about cybersecurity um, and the opportunities that are available out there and a bit about academia. So I guess we open it to questions. Well, essentially, it's impossible to know because uh, if, if I don't know how familiar you are with things like Tor and the dark net, but basically military grade encryption is now available to anyone who wants to download off the internet. So Tor, that's the onion router and the dark net. So a lot of these attacks kind of originate from these places and we can't trace them back. But the census attack itself was a fairly uh, easy one to do. So it would be available to someone with minimal skill. Uh, it was a denial of service attack. So remember that idea of flooding a website with requests so it can't work. And that can be done um, through these things called botnets and networks like that. But essentially it's not very hard to do. So it could have been either. It could have been a protest. It could have been the Chinese government for, you know, trying to embarrass the Australian government. We don't know uh, all the facts. Um, they do for a start, so I think that you, with the FBI, uh, how familiar you are with that Apple and the FBI had a big fight over getting into the San Bernardino shootings t uh, iPhone, and in the end Apple said they wouldn't let them do it, and then the FBI was able to find someone who could do it for them, so they do. But the problem is, is uh, a lot of the ISIS types uh, fighters, they don't use iPhones because they know how easy it is to be hacked. So they're reverting back to quite old um, technology, so they write letters and things like that. But essentially, the, if you really want a really good documentary that I, I recommend all of you watch, um, it's called Citizen 4, and it's about the NSA and their mass surveillance program. And essentially, all of your Androids and iPhones and uh, Gmail accounts and Facebook and Snapchat, all of those are American companies. And the NSA basically works with these American companies to uh, mine data. So it all gets recorded, every snap you send, every Facebook message you send, it's all, every WhatsApp message, it's all collected. So they are, they are doing these start things. Um, and it's helping them effectively uh, prosec prosecute terrorists, but it's also a huge privacy concerns as well. Absolutely there is. And so I mentioned muting before. So Toastmasters um, is kind of for anyone who wants to improve their public speaking, but speaking in a court is a specific skill that you'd want to learn if you want to be a lawyer. So muting is a great example of that. And so you, there's muting is like it's its own business. So Macquarie University has muting, all universities have muting, and they have national champions, so it's competitive. And then they have like the Jessup moot, which is a really prestigious international moot. So that would be my advice to you if you want to learn public speaking skills. I should uh, note that 
If you want to get up in court and argue as a lawyer, there's only very specific areas of law that do that. So if you want to do that, look at family and criminal law because they usually go to court. Most lawyer work is transactional. So it's creating contracts and drafting it. So it's office work. Um, not that it's not interesting, but this idea that everyone goes to court who's a lawyer uh, is probably more in family and criminal law. And if you want to be a corporate lawyer, who wants to go into court, then you have to look at becoming a barrister, but we're looking at a, like a 10, 15, 20 year uh, cycle between university to becoming a barrister. But absolutely, mooting is something I look into, but even now, go into Toastmasters, anything, drama clubs, anything that's getting you out there talking um, will help. I think, do you, do you have, um, I know that some high schools have that, in, um, I've heard of, so it's mock trial. So basically they just give you a fact scenario and you know, like, I don't know, like Jenny was drunk one night and crashed a car into a ditch and then the police went to arrest her for uh, driving under the influence. However, she was drunk because she took cough medicine and didn't realize that it had alcohol in it. Um, argue. And so you have to argue how culpable Jenny is. And so one case would be the prosecutor and one would be the defense. And then they'll have, and sometimes we can have ex judges come in, but they're usually other practitioners. I've judged a few myself. And it's basically teaching you how to um, courtroom procedure. So for instance, when you cross examine someone, it's nothing like the movies, unfortunately, uh, where you know, you make your client cry and they confess the, the crime. Uh, it's more, it's what they call quite forensic. So you have to ask certain questions. So you can't ask them leading questions. So you can't be like, uh, Jenny, were you drunk at the time? Uh, because that's a yes or no question. You have to like, Jenny, at the time, what was your state of mind at the time of the accident? And then she'd be like, oh, like I was feeling woozy, for instance. And then you try to build a case against her. So that's, mooting is like, it's like debating, but using the rules of evidence, which is what courtrooms are, essentially. Legal studies is very interesting, but it's not nothing like studying law as well. So if you don't enjoy legal, like I've had students who don't enjoy legal studies and then love studying law and vice versa. But essentially, um, it's a good start. So you get to know the legal system. But well, we well, we're training you to as a lawyer, you're trained to give advice. So 99% of a law is someone comes to you and says, "Hey, I want to buy a house. How do I do that?" And you're like, "Oh, well, you have to you know conveyance and exchange of contracts and." This is a sale of land contract and this is what you can and can't do. So that's mainly what you're doing. So we learn the law from that point of view. Um, you're probably in legal studies, you more learn the concepts of what is family law, what is international law, things like that. Australia's uh, intelligence is quite good. Um, because we're a member of Five Eyes. So Five Eyes is a security uh, allegiance between America, UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And so we all collaborate quite well on uh, intelligence. So all that good American NSA mass surveillance of their foreign um, adversaries are in theory available to us. So we can kind of leverage off them as well. Um, but I think that the really good thing is in our industry, well, my industry, cybersecurity, and why you guys should consider it is uh, we've got a very switched on prime minister who uh, started his own IT uh, startup before it was cool. He started Oz Email, so he started a, a computer internet company and it was hacked. And so he has first-hand experience of cybersecurity and that is always good to have it as a national priority. And already, like I said, he's released $231 million. He said he wants to make Australia the cybersecurity powerhouse in Asia and he really wants to expand our capabilities. So currently I'm confident that we have very well trained people and we can leverage off the Americans and our allies. And also it's a national priority and we're getting a lot of money poured into that. And we have a prime minister who has first hand experience. So it's all kind of lining up quite nicely for uh, cybersecurity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, digital audience. <laughs> <laughs>